We are live. Thank you very much, um, Council Member Ben Kalis. Thank you for joining us this evening for our uh, second uh, town hall involving the Department of Education and Schools. This is our back to school town hall. Uh, and uh, we have uh, Department of Education Deputy Chancellor Adrian Austin, who we'll be hearing from soon. Uh, but before that, we have once a teacher, always a teacher, That's true. Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. Uh, and we'd like to just ask her if she can give us some opening remarks. Uh, and uh, before she does, I just want to give a, a heartfelt thank you for all of your work trying to save uh, democracy. And uh, funny enough, the best way to save democracy was apparently to save our post office. So if you can share a lot of your work in DC on that. Okay, well, well thank you so much, Council Member Kalos uh, and the Board of Education uh, for setting up tonight's meeting. I, I am a former New York City public school teacher as has been noted and the mother of two children. So I am deeply concerned about the lack of concrete plans uh, from the administration for the fall school year which is set to start in less than two weeks. Uh, schools are struggling to physically reopen safely uh, because of this administration's uh, failed response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And unfortunately, it has made uh, it uh, impossible for many uh, schools to open for in-person uh, edu in -person education at this point. Uh, more than 100 days ago, uh, we passed in Congress the so-called HEROES Act. Uh, it has not been voted on in the Senate. This bill would direct more than $100 billion in K-12 through education funding and an additional $1 trillion in state and local funding to prevent uh, deep cuts to public education. It also included in the infrastructure bill $130 billion uh, for school construction and repair and this included the ventilation systems, which we have a challenge with here in New York and, and other repairs that are needed. I, I would say the absolute uh, North Star is the health and safety of New York City's school children. It is what is the most important thing to me and I'm sure to every parent. And we cannot let this pandemic further exacerbate, exacerbate the, the uh, exacerbate the inequities in our education system. Um, the challenge needs national leadership, but we, uh, we can't get it from this administration. Their response has been to reopen or we will cut your funding. Uh, this is not a plan, this is not a response. We cannot reopen schools and hope for the best. Over the last two weeks alone, it's been reported that roughly 70,000 of our school children have contracted the virus. So this is uh, an unprecedented crisis uh, in our city's history and I'm going to uh, work hard on it. It's gonna take all of us talking and working together uh, to, to solve it. I'll be going back to Congress uh, this week and next week where we are pushing the Senate to pass the HEROES Act and get the state and city funding that we need for education uh, I really want to hear from all of you tonight. I'm here to listen and to support you in every way. But as a congressperson, it's my duty to get the federal funding, the needed federal funding uh, for education to the school system of New York. And that's my top priority. Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you, Congress member, uh, for joining us, given everything that you're doing in Washington for all of us here in the city and throughout our nation. Uh, we've been working closely with Department of Education, sending letter after letter, perhaps too many letters, proposing solutions like remote learning centers, identifying new locations for schools, using those closed by archdiocese, even desegregating all remote online learning. We supported parents and students, including those at PS. 290 and CEC2 as we advocated for and won commitments for, new, for a nurse in every school and we'll learn more about that. We also heard from parents and in particular students and our teachers and our principals and, and public health experts who are all for, for once and people tend to disagree but everyone was speaking in one unified voice asking to delay the opening of schools. Uh, the teachers have already started 
in-person learning was going to start on the 10th. That's going to be remote, uh, but we are now on track for the 21st. And uh, we actually scheduled this back in July and August, thinking we might be two days away from it. Uh, but even with the in-person opening on, on the 21st, I think a lot of the questions are there. We've got about 150 RSVPs for tonight's town hall. We already have about 58 folks. We also have folks watching on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, you can feel free to submit questions tonight by uh, tweeting at me or tagging on Facebook. It's at Ben Kalos. Uh, I'd say we've received about 50 to 100 questions already, so we're going to do our best to ask as many of the questions as possible. Uh, it's, it was given the short time, it didn't seem like it would work if we called on individuals to ask their questions, so I'll just be asking questions for people. And um, if your question does not get answered tonight, uh, feel free to email me questions at bencalos.com. We will forward your questions to DOE and do our best to get you a timely response. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to uh, De Department of Education Deputy Chancellor Adrian Austin uh, to give a quick opening. Thank you. Thank you, Congress member, I'm sorry, Council Member Kalos, Congresswoman Maloney, um, just for, for hosting this panel and organizing this event for our families. Uh, I certainly have been uh, communicating as frequently uh, as, in as much detail as I can with our families. I know there's a real um, thirst for information because so many things are moving quickly and we're being adaptive and responsive at the Department of Education as we move into a really unprecedented type of school year. Uh, weeks ago now, the Chancellor and Mayor announced that we will be doing blended learning in New York City, which is a combination of remote instruction and in-person learning. Uh, and we were very pleased that uh, through cooperative conversations between our labor partners, our mayor, our chancellor, uh, we were able to get to a place where we believe that we can safely reopen schools on September 21st. So just to give, I, I know you kind of gave us a preview counts, uh, councilman of the calendar and sort of how the next week and a half or so is going to unfold. Uh, our teachers went back today. They started engaging in professional learning. We want our remote instruction to look and feel different as we approach the fall. And part of that is just making sure that we invest the time, the resources in our teachers to make sure we have a different uh, quality experience for our students when we go into remote only uh, remote instruction in the fall. And so September 16th, our students will be joining. They'll be coming back remote only uh, for this first sort of transitional period as we open the school year. And so students will be there. They will be engaging remotely with their teachers. The focus will be social emotional transition. So sort of getting, building a community, um, building a classroom environment that's supportive of students, particularly because, um, you know, students, need some of that based on the fact that they're transitioning from the summer and then just understanding what our students have been through over the course of the last six months. And from there on the 21st, we will begin in-person learning for families that have opted into blended learning. So a lot happening within the, the last, you know, I, really six months. I mean, we have been going nonstop, I think, in the Department of Education um, for the last six months. And uh, a lot of the work for the last few weeks has just been really focused on making sure we're prepared to receive students in person. So there have been uh, school action ventilation teams who have been working within the last few weeks to follow up on a round of inspections that had already taken place with our internal engineers um, to do ventilation inspections. They, vent they inspected every single school's air quality, air ventilation system. And all of those reports for every single school across New York City is available on our website. So if you go to our website, www.schools.nyc.gov, and you go to find a school, parents can look up their school, they can look up uh, the last, the most recent, which is, you know, within the last few weeks, um, inspection report for the ventilation system, which will tell them literally classroom by classroom, what the outcome of that inspection was. Uh, similarly, um, we've been working to make sure that there's PPE in all of our schools, making sure that there's hand sanitizer, disinfectant wipes, uh, disposable gloves, masks, everything that you can imagine um, that's needed to really make sure that we are safely receiving students and implementing social distancing, 
um, and the sanitation that's required to, to bring students back in a safe way. So I want to I want to thank before I before I sort of end my um, my opening. I want to thank our principals who this has been a yeoman's task. They have worked incredibly hard. A lot of them did not take vacations for the first time probably in years um, because they were working to make sure that they were prepared to receive staff and students for this school year. Um, they've had to rethink a lot of their policies and procedures because we are reopening in blended learning. So thank you to the principals. Thank you to our teachers who are learning a new way of teaching and uh, like all of us, you know, get preparing for a really challenging school year that's very different. Um, so thank you to our teachers, our custodians who have been doing the work of the inspections and cleaning our school buildings, our school food workers, our parent coordinators, our FLCs, our secretary, just all of our staff. I just want to thank everyone because it's been an incredible lift. And I think we have got, come leaps and bounds from uh, week to week to week as everyone is wor really working on, on over overcharge uh, to get us to this place where we're ready to reopen schools and, and receive students. And, um, and thank you to the parents, of course, the families who are patient with us through this process. I know it's a lot of information to absorb. I know there's lots of questions, which is why I'm here. Uh, and with that, I'm looking forward to answering questions. Uh, thank you. So you threw a lot of information. If you go to schools.nyc.gov, on the front page, there is a slider with a beautiful picture of kids at school uh, before the pandemic. And uh, there's a school's calendar. Uh, there's information about the remote learning centers, the learning bridges. And then the last button is building ventilation survey. If you click that, there's an option to search for your school. So you can learn that. And so um, let's just jump into the ventilation piece because I think that's where we're seeing a lot of questions, including folks who have posted it in our Q&A. Uh, so I think we received probably about 10 of these. But um, Joshua Wilson at 6.07 p.m. said, what is the standard for determining adequate ventilation? What research or quantifiable science are those criteria based on? How many schools have passed ventilation uh, tests? Uh, and then just along the same line, uh, I'm just looking. Uh, is there a public record on the air exchange rates by school and classroom? What's the standard for adequate ventilation? Uh, what's the research? Um, so yeah, big, big first question is the ventilation question. Of course, I, that's kind of where I started because I knew I, I speak with parents all the time. I know this is top of mind for all of our families. Um, I can tell you that the we had an independent team of engineers come in through our uh, school construction authority and they are the ones who did this latest round of inspections. Um, they surveyed all together 115,392 spaces which just like the when you think through the number it's an incredible amount of space. Um, of that 64,550 were classrooms, 23,000 were bathrooms, over 28,000 were office administrative spaces within schools. Um, and what they found were that 96% of our classrooms were deemed operational, meaning that they ha either had windows that were able to open, um, they had exhaust fans or supply fans that would work to exchange um, air within buildings and make sure that there were air circulations or unit ventilators. And so what we committed to, what the mayor and the chancellor are very publicly committed to is, if we cannot make a space available, we will not use that space. Principals will not use that space. Students will not be in that space. St staff will not be in that space. So if there's no ventilation, if there's no air circulation, if it's not safe, then, then we will not expose anyone to that space. If there are schools that are not safe, meaning there's not enough air circulation um, and, and there's not, a, you know, our ventilation systems are not in place, um, then we will not use those schools. And so I can tell you that for this week, there are 10 buildings, I believe it's 21 schools that are not open. Uh, and they're not open because after this round of inspections, um, there were lots and lots of repairs that needed to take place. And so those buildings were taken offline. All of those staff members are still reporting. So they're reporting virtually, remotely, and engaging in professional learning remotely. But they're not in person in those school buildings because they've been taken offline until all of the repairs can be made. So that is the commitment and that is the work that is still underway and still ongoing and will be probably right up to September 20th um, to make sure that that's, you know, we are remedying those spaces as much as we can. If we cannot, then, then we will have to rethink 
um, you know, what we're going to do because we can't use spaces that, that don't pass these ventilation checks. Okay, and so to be clear, it was professionals who do this, not teachers or, not, or education professionals. We have a follow-up question from Emily Fuhr and Allegra Legrand. Uh, the questions seem to revolve around uh, whether it's a question of like, was the survey for ventilation? Was it whether or not there was a window that opened? And it seems both people plus additional questions we received are focused on air exchange rate per hour. This is not something I have any expertise on. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that I rely on uh, my parents. And, and I am very lucky because I have the smartest constituents in the city. <laughs> uh, these, this is a great question. I am also not an expert on um, air exchange and ventilation. What I can tell you is that there were professional engineers through SCA that were independent contractors who did do the inspections. Um, I can also tell you that our division of school facilities who oversees uh, air, qual this, or air quality within our schools, meaning they are responsible for the maintenance for all of our ventilation systems, um, submitted a plan, constructed a plan with partnership from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And so um, that, that is, those are the experts who are sort of figuring this stuff out uh, and deciding, you know, what are, what are the standards uh, and, and if we can't meet, what are the standards that we need to meet? Uh, and then if we can't meet those standards, what needs to happen in order to make sure that we, you know, what are the upgrades that are needed? What are the fixes that are needed to bring us to that, those standards? Uh, and if there's no solution, then taking those, those spaces offline. Thank you. Uh, and, and so uh, I'm actually checking the, the database that, that was posted in terms of what is there. So um, what I'm seeing, I, I just looked up Manhattan New School, PS290. So uh, they have the room number, whether or not it has windows, whether the window can be open, whether there's a supply fan, whether or not there's an exhaust fan, and uh, whether or not there's a ventilation. So it, it looks like for most of the uh, rooms in, in PS290, there is no ventilation. There, this, this is a 100 year old building. There are no exhaust fans uh, and it's just a supply fan and, and windows. So um, I think that is some of the concern parents have given uh, from things. I, I also just want, want to thank our Congress member because uh, uh, I would say a lot of elected officials jump on, jump off, but sh she's staying on to listen to the questions from the uh, parents and uh, just being there to be a strong representative for us. Um, another question is uh, just, can you please explain the testing plan for the school year? Will everyone get a COVID screening prior to entry into the building before the school year? Once school starts, will there be random COVID checks and daily temperature checks. Will there be a fast track for school results? Uh, testing for all staff in schools recommended but not required. Random tested will not be until October with 10 to 20% threshold. How do we ensure students and staff can stay safe with this plan? Uh, why does the testing not start until October? Will every school have COVID tests? Those were uh, the, the group on testing. <laughs> Great questions. Uh, I can tell you that we, have, we are prioritizing DOE students uh, and staff for testing across the city. And so there are 34 sites across the city. Um, we have been told that results will be provided within 24 to 48 hours uh, of taking the test. So there will be swift results. And please, if you are a, um, a parent, please go to the New York City Department of Health site or a staff member, go to the health site uh, and you can sign up and register in advance to make an appointment um, for those tests. And I believe there's a two day in advance uh, appointment option um, I think you just stated, Councilman Kalos, uh, what, the, what the policy is. So 20% of individuals in the schools with fewer than 500 students will be uh, randomly sampled um, for, for COVID testing at the beginning of October 1st, 15% uh, in schools with 500 to 999 students and 10% um, of individuals in the schools that have over 1,000 students. So that, that's the, the range of between 10 to 20%. It's based on the, the size of the school, uh, how, long, how large the, the sample of students tested will need to be and staff tested will need to be in order to be statistically significant. Uh, and what I can tell you in terms of the timeline is we cannot test students 
unless we have consent from the parents. And so one of the things that parents who have opted into blended learning can expect to receive uh, is a consent form. And we will be asking for all families to return that, that consent form so that we can begin testing uh, October 1st. So there has to be a window of time where um, families are able to submit those forms. And that's, that's part of the reason for allowing for, for that to happen. I, I mentioned this in my opening. We, we heard from a number of different schools, particularly PS290, who did a petition. Uh, we, we've been pushing pretty hard before the pandemic. There are schools that uh, have always said that they did not have a full-time nurse, that they had to share their nurses amongst multiple schools. Uh, we, we advocated the mayor announced that there would be a nurse in every school. Uh, so we just wanted to confirm that there will be in fact a, a full-time nurse in every school building for any of the hours that the children are there. And we also wanted to see where we are in terms of hiring them and will you open up a school if it doesn't have a school nurse? Uh, the, uh, yes. Great questions. Um, yes, there we are committed to having a nurse in every school building and we are very close to meeting that. We have until the 21st, so we're literally uh, making staff assignments. Part of the challenge with the Department of Education and hiring, especially when we're talking about um, sort of this like a large batch hiring is that we have a really rigorous background process, which we're proud of um, actually, uh, but it does take some time to do fingerprinting and all of the other background um, processes required to actually assign staff to schools. And so we're in that process. We are very close uh, to, to being in the place of having one nurse in every school building and we believe we'll be there by the 21st. I, I see a lot of questions coming in on the Q&A feature. I'm gonna to try to get to the folks who submitted questions ahead of time. Uh, so uh, one of the questions are on masks. And so uh, they range from, are there any health issues with a child wearing a mask all day to what does what is the school's policy going to be if a student doesn't follow the mask policy? And then we had a specific question related to District 75 students and students with an IEP um, who uh, from Vicki Hayes, what plan is in place for District 75 whom students would have problems with understanding and keeping masks on. And I, again, I, I am doing my best to actually just read the questions as they're coming in. So I'm not editorializing or um, I, I don't have a student in District 75 and I do know there's a range where there are students who would understand that they need to wear a mask, but there are many students who, depending on their mobility and uh, uh, disability, might not. Uh, great questions. So we are expecting every student to wear a mask uh, where possible. And so we are going to work with our students. We are going to educate our students about why it's important to wear a mask and how it's related to preventing the transmission of COVID and keeping everyone safe. Um, our teachers are going to speak with students. We will have, you know, principals will be speaking to students for whom, um, you know, there's, there's some resistance. I can tell you that we've been operating our regional enrichment centers for, since March, and we haven't actually seen this as, as an issue uh, because one of the things that our educators are really good at um, is sort of getting children to understand the rules and then follow the rules. And so our expectation is that that will continue. We do know that for some students, um, this may be a medical issue. It may be uh, to the point of, it sounds like one of the, the, the folks who submitted a question, maybe it's a student who's autistic and actually just can't tolerate a mask. Um, we also, in addition to masks, have, um, have face shields. So maybe that's an option for students who can't tolerate the mask or have some sort of a medical condition. We would ask if you have a child who has a severe condition of some sort that will prohibit that child from being successful with mask wearing, uh, please reach out to your principal immediately so that the principal can start thinking through um, what to do, what kind of accommodations can be made, uh, and whether this is a, a matter of requesting a 504 medical accommodation for that student um, and, and what to do and, and work with the school nurse to, to be able to create a plan for the, for the child. Uh, we now have questions about teaching staff. Uh, similar to the nurses, uh, there are a lot of concern we've heard that if there's going to be uh, lower student teacher ratios, hybrid learning and, and different challenges that we will need more staff. Uh, and so we, we understand that from press conferences that there's a representation that there's enough teachers. But I think the exact question here is, 
the DOE says there will be enough teachers, but if all teachers for let's say third grade have in-person students every day, then who is teaching the kids when they are remote? So wh where are we on having enough teaching staff? Uh, we are we are working to make sure we have enough you know teachers who are there in person. Uh, we are working to make sure that we also have teachers who are um, assigned to students who are remote only, uh, for which there are, are, are many children as well. Um, and just, I guess, to, to back up and give a preview of what the plan is, um, the plan for students who are in blended learning is that they will be assigned two teachers, well, one teacher who is in person in the classroom during the days that students are coming in the building, and then one teacher who is teaching remotely. Uh, there is a plan in the very beginning of the day that those teachers will have 30 minutes to sort of sync up, to coordinate, to plan, so that there's continuity uh, a, a, a against cohorts uh, as they're engaging in blended versus in-person instruction. Um, and then there will be teachers who are teaching separately that are teaching the remote only students, so students who have opted into remote only. Uh, we are planning, we have committed to making sure we have certified teachers teach all of our students. And so, you know, the magical question is like, how do you get there? Um, I will say it's a very complicated process. Many of our teachers have requested accommodations. Uh, I believe somewhere roughly around 20% uh, have been approved for accommodations. We are, you know, obviously working with those teachers to teach remotely, and those will be the remote only uh, instruction teachers. But we are we are still working to to make sure that we have enough staff. I can say, you know, we are looking at our substitute teachers. Um, many of our central employees are actually pedagogues, so they're folks who, you know, maybe had part of their career in schools as teachers, uh, moved around, were administrators, and are now in central staff. Um, those teachers, those, those folks who are in Central who have teaching licenses are being redeployed to schools to use their teaching credentials uh, in, in, in alignment with whatever the subject matters they are certified in. So all of that matching is still happening uh, and, and we plan to have that all sort of coordinated and, and parents by now um, should have gotten information specifically from their school, from their principal about class assignments. Um, and also teacher assignments. And so that information um, is, is coming together uh, and, and must be fully together, obviously, by, by the 21st. On the same talk of, topic of staff, uh, this is another question I'll just read verbatim. How are we ensuring that teachers who are immunocompromised or living with someone who is immunocompromised can teach from home? What are the options for these teachers and create mandate that schools have to allow at-risk teachers the option of teaching from home for the entire school year. Yes, so this sort of goes to the point I made earlier about, you know, many of our teachers, uh, around 20% have requested accommodations. So whether or not we're in a pandemic, uh, if a DOE staff member has a medical condition, they can request an accommodation under the ADA. Uh, and so there are many teachers, around 20%, who, because they have these underlying conditions, uh, have requested a medical accommodation and our Office of Equal Opportunity and our human resources have reviewed those um, and in cases where there's a substantiated medical accommodation obviously have granted those and those teachers indeed will be working remotely. So that that there's a process. Uh, it's not unfamiliar because it's a process that um, exists just sort of generally in terms of how we process medical accommodations under ADA um, and uh, roughly 20% of, of teachers have actually availed themselves and been granted accommodations. Uh, Deputy Chancellor, I, I want to just say I've done a number of these and we are kind of moving right along and I've lost count of the questions, but uh, both the fact that you are still smiling and these are not, these are not questions I could answer on my own. Uh, so we're going to move over to the remote learning and the blended hybrid model. Uh, okay. The, there's a whole bunch, so I'm just gonna, I think they're all pretty good, so it's hard for me to decide which ones to ask. Uh, do you happen to know the number of opt-outs of people doing entirely remote versus blended for school district two? Ooh, I do not have that stat on me, but I'm sure we can follow up with that information. Okay, uh, and you, and yeah. Who asked that question emails questions at Ben Kalos, we will, we will get that for you. And the superintendent and the community education council for district two definitely have that information. Um, which just to make a plug because I do oversee the family office of family and community empowerment. 
Uh, for parents who want up-to-date information, there are public meetings that happen every month for District 2. They're held by the Community Education Council for that district. The superintendent is there. Uh, and so there's a public comment period where you can directly ask questions of the council, ask questions of the superintendent. That's the poll kind of function and purpose of that meeting. And it's a great opportunity to, to get really localized information around what's happening. Okay, I have about three or four questions. I'm gonna do my best to group together. We have a question from Andrew Mezzo, a question from Debbie Mayer, and a question from anonymous attendee. Uh, and the, the question relate, and then we also had ones that were submitted. Uh, they all relate to uh, children who are having difficulty learning remotely or even through the hybrid model. Uh, will there be resources for children, parents to use if they feel their child is having issues learning due to the current learning environment? Can struggling readers and dyslexic kids get access to expertise via online learning no matter what school they are zoned for? Uh, what resources will be provided if we feel our child is not successfully learning in the current planned environment? Uh, the literacy crisis affects students equally, but not equitably struggling readers with resources can get into schools like Winward. The DOE has been sacred. The time remote instruction, can we guard? Uh, and then anonymous was, um, will any attention this evening be given to the education side of the equation? What is DOE doing to ensure robust learning experience under both hybrid and remote models? Is it true that students on their in-person days must still be getting remote education from a teacher at home? Okay, I'm going to try to answer all thousand questions <laughs> that you just read all in one shot. Hopefully I, I hit them all. Um, I'm trying to group them together. It was a good, it was a tight grouping. I'm going to try to remember them all. Um, I can tell you that we are planning on uh, delivering a much more ro robust uh, version of remote learning. I think we learned a lot from the spring. One of the things that I heard most frequently from, from families was that there was not enough, uh, or in some cases, none at all live instruction from teachers and remote, and that won't be the case this year. One of the things that we really advocated for and are, are happy that we're able to deliver is live instruction Monday through Friday for all students, uh, whether it is uh, remote or whether it is in person. And so for students who are uh, either in remote only or on their remote days, they will have uh, increments of remote, like, I'm sorry, increments of live synchronous instruction with their teachers, and there are bands. And so I can tell you, for example, um, from kindergarten to like fifth grade in September, families can expect that the students will have between 65 minutes and 110 minutes with their teacher. That increases in sort of quarterly across the year. So um, by January, February, students in kindergarten will have 120 minutes of live instruction, three to five will have 150 to 210 minutes of instruction. And that continues. The more, the older the students are, the more sort of live instruction via remote, like virtual live instruction they will have. And then for all grade bands, it's increasing over the course of the school year. So as students are getting uh, used to being um, this is a different environment for all of us, including our kids. So as, as students are getting accustomed to engaging with their teachers and their classmates live via, you know, the, the video conferencing, video chat, um, they, will, and they will have extended periods of time where they're doing that. Um, so that is one of the main differences that, that families can expect to experience. I would say if there is a student um, who, uh, part of this, if, if there's a student who is not learning well in remote learning, uh, and a family wants initially op op opted into remote only, but wants to rethink that decision, there will be these periods quarterly where parents can opt back into blended learning. So for a family who opted for remote only now uh, and wants to opt back into blended learning in let's say November, which is the, gonna be the next opportunity to opt back in, they can do so. And those periods are gonna be extended to, to families quarterly. Uh, if remote learning isn't working for their children. And then another just point that I wanted to add, and I'll make sure we send this to you as well. Our chief academic office has really, they've curated a really good set of videos for families and specifically for families with students with disabilities to help support learning at home. So I will share the link to that. They're these like, they're all on YouTube, but they're videos that are really, um, made to support learning and, and give some instructional guidance and sort of tips and tricks um, from educators to parents who want to 
support uh, the remote learning experience. So I, I'll make sure that we send that to you as well so you can share that with our, our parents. Uh, there, there's a couple of folks commenting, asking for a little bit more information or specifics. If, if you feel that you're not getting the, the answers you were hoping for tonight, please email questions at bencalos.com or post it spe more specifics uh, on the uh, Q&A. We're, we're doing our best to do so. Uh, we have a specific, uh, we, we have, I guess, two related questions. So one is, what will a typical student day look like for 100% remote learners? Will it run from 8.30 to 2 p.m.? How many live interactive synchronous classes should the kids be expected per day or per week? So I, I want to just say the best place to find, because because there's like charts, they're visual charts, and, and that's the best way to sort of understand for each grade band um, how much live instruction they, that families can expect to receive from their teacher, and that's online. So please go to our website, um, and I can send a link, sort of a PowerPoint, if that's helpful after this, that just sort of has the breakdown of minutes um, per grade band. Uh, I can tell you a typical remote experience for, let's say, you know, kindergarten through fifth grade may include like a morning meeting with social emotional learning. There's going to be ELA daily, so foundational skills, a focus on reading and writing, uh, math daily, science and social studies three to four times a week with music, art, physical education, and other special subject areas rotated in. Um, and there's going to be, and this again is your is teacher discretion, a combination of live instruction, mini lessons, small group instruction, individualized instruction, and then on top of the live instruction uh, that's that's curated for each class, um, there will be asynchronous learning. So there'll be assignments that are posted online for students to do outside of this period of live instruction. Um, we have over 1600 schools. And so what that means is that different schools have different school schedules and it's always been that way. I think it's complicated, you know, sort of in this environment where we're like, you know, we want to standardize everything. It's hard to standardize when you have as many schools as we do and we don't expect that, you know, it's not possible to do that. Um, so the best source of information just in terms of what your school schedule is going to be is talking to the principal of your school and and I think all principals at this point have sent out schedules. Um, they have done the work of assigning class programs to every student. Uh, they've done the work of setting out schedules to families. And so families at this point should have a very good idea of what their child has been programmed to and, and what the um, daily schedule is going to be. And if they don't, please reach out, to, that reach out directly to me, um, austin 4 at schools.nyc.gov, uh, and we will immediately sort of troubleshoot that, but every student should have a program. Uh, on that note, you should expect to get an email from uh, Karen Locastro. Uh, she uh, questioned, she said, we don't have the teacher or classroom assignment yet for PS 151, feeling very in the dark with a child entering UPK our first year in the NYC DOE system. Thank you very much. Send it my way and I will make sure to connect you directly and get you some answers. Uh, we, we are a little bit past the halfway mark, and uh, we have about 20 minutes left of these rapid fire questions. I want to turn to an anonymous attendee who says, since uh, Representative Maloney is here, what will Congress do when, not if, the United States Postal Service Board of Governors refuse to do anything about Louis DeJoy? What next to hold this scoff law accountable for the damage he's done to the USPS, the campaign fraud, and lying to Congress, thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I, education is so important. I didn't wanna raise any other issue but education and that's why uh, we have so many parents and concerned citizens on this call tonight. Thank you again, Ben, for setting it up. Uh, that was an informed question. Uh, we just started this investigation uh, on, uh, uh, we had been uh, asking to get documents for some time. We had a hearing uh, two weeks ago on Monday, and uh, I asked for the documents on Wednesday. He refused. Uh, we gave them till Friday. He refused. Uh, so uh, this past Monday, we, we issued a notice of a subpoena gave everybody 48 hours to know that it was coming and it was issued and he started com complying with documentation on how he made the ridiculous decision 
to take steps to slow down the mail in the middle of a pandemic, hurting many, many people, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the right next two months away from a, a very important election. Uh, we, uh, personally, I don't think he should have been appoint, uh, appointed in the first place. His only qualification me, seems to be that he was a mega donor uh, to uh, President Trump and, and the Republican Party. He held uh, major uh, positions in the party. His wife is on the list to become the ambassador to Canada. She's the former ambassador to Trinidad. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, there was a firm that was called in to make a, a, an informed professional recommendation for who should be uh, the next postmaster general. His name wasn't even on the list, and uh, he got appointed, so we want to know how in the world did that happen. Uh, and we have numerous allegations of uh, serious campaign finance uh, allegations that have come in. We're at the beginning of this investigation. We do have people that are volunteering to come in and talk to us. Uh, we need to get the facts together. It's a premature to uh, make any decisions or statements now, but I will say the Board of Governors that appointed him they have the power to remove him. And personally, I think he should be suspended immediately uh, while we uh, go forward with our investigation. Also, his testimony before the Senate and the House uh, was very different. Uh, he said he knew nothing about these uh, delays uh, before the Senate. Uh, then when it came to the House, we had internal documents that were given to us from professionals at the post office that showed in every major category under his tenure of only two months, that they had uh, fallen anywhere from 10 to 6% in, in uh, productivity. If it was the chancellor of New York or the deputy chancellor uh, that had a record like that, uh, they would have been out of the door by now. They would have been gone. Uh, but they never would have gotten the job in the first place. Uh, so I would say anybody in the private sector that uh, decreased the productivity, uh, that hurt the output to the American people, and this is very special. The Postal Service is not an agency. It's an independent organization. It's a pillar of our democracy. It's enshrined in our Constitution. And it's there to serve the American people. So when you delay the mail, you're delaying uh, veterans getting their medications, uh, students getting their school supplies, and, and all kinds of people getting their packages that they need to conduct business and, and, and move their lives forward. They're stressed anyway because of the pandemic. Then to have the mail not functioning, particularly uh, mail in ballots. Mail in ballots. Uh, we estimate, or professionals are estimating, 75% of Americans, because of the pandemic, uh, will be voting by mail. So we need to fund the, the post office. Uh, the House took an unprecedented uh, action. I've never seen it the entire time I've been in Congress. They called us in for an emergency session on Saturday after I revealed what was happening, and they passed uh, uh, unanimously by Democrats and, and 26 Republicans, it was bipartisan, my bill called Delivering for America, which would fund the post office, the 25 billion that the professionals have said they've lost because of the COVID response and, and also reversing the very harmful actions that uh, DeJoy has taken. That it, uh, there, now we have uh, professional documentation that it has slowed down the mail. Why did he make these decisions? Uh, what was it based on? So our first batch of subpoenas were really based on the mail delay. How did that happen? How was this decision made? Uh, but now we're getting multitudes of uh, information and starting investigations, not only on alleged um, major uh, violations of campaign finance law, uh, also uh, uh, really changing his testimony on who he spoke to in the Trump campaign and really how he was uh, appointed in the first place in a very strange way, where he wasn't even on the list of, of, of recommended uh, qualified people for the job. I mean, did he just walk in the back door? I mean, how did this happen? So we are re requesting more information. I do wanna note that it's not even a, a problem just in New York. They do estimate that in Ben's district, your mail is five to six days late in your district. Uh, but in some, in one uh, person in the, uh, Virginia reported they mailed a letter to someone three blocks from them, and it took them 15 days to get there. So the, the uh, stories are coming in across the country of the blue mailboxes being removed. Uh, what I find startling is they stop the processing centers. The processing centers as machinery that can process 30,000 
um, uh, uh, pieces of mail and sort it to the zip code it's supposed to go to. They've been busily going around uh, dismantling them. Uh, and all the male professionals are saying we need them. That's, a, that's a, a tool that we need. So we're trying to understand why in the world they did it in the first place. Our hearing resulted in them halting the uh, problematic, dangerous decisions that he had made in terms of getting mail to people. We're trying to reverse it. And the door has opened, as I said, in all these other areas uh, that need to be investigated. Uh, we are just in the prelim preliminary stages and, uh, and uh, it, it would be premature for me to comment on exactly the steps we're taking. Uh, but the allegations are serious, they're strong, they're well documented, they're coming in every day. And I yield back to our distinguished uh, council member and deputy chancellor. Uh, it's great to see such qualified people in our school system and, and such uh, dedicated elected officials uh, really putting their heart into helping uh, parents and teachers and students during this really heartbreaking time. Uh, it has been a challenge uh, worse than any I've ever seen. I thought 9-11 was horrible. I thought the, the financial crisis was horrible. This is, uh, this is worse by many, many steps. And uh, I wanna thank them and all of the parents and concerned uh, citizens that are here, part of becoming and being part of a solution. And I know when I go back to Congress this week that my job is to get that money uh, for our city school system so that you can do your job. It's a, and believe me, it's my top priority and I know firsthand how important it is. So I yield back and thank you. And I thank, thank you for the question. Thank you. I'm gonna ask questions a little bit slower. We got some feedback online to slow down the questions. Uh, we have uh, two questions, one through the Q&A and one that was pre-submitted and uh, we only have about a page left of the questions. We are concerned that kids will be eating lunch indoors when we have an open indoor dining in the city. Can you please explain how students are safe to eat? And the online question is, uh, why are we comfortable with kids eating indoors without masks when uh, Cuomo slash de Blasio have not opened indoor dining in the city? Thank you for that question. Uh, so we will be having indoor, uh, indoor lunch for, for students in the classroom. Uh, students will be seated six feet apart, they will be socially distant. Uh, instruction will continue during that time and in part that's to make sure that students are sort of focused and they're engaged uh, rather, than, rather than having a normal sort of social uh, lunch, which then sort of goes into the difference between um, what we're going to be doing and what happens in a restaurant. When you're in a restaurant and you're eating dinner with your friends, you're not socially distant, uh, you're talking, you're enjoying yourself, you're telling stories, sharing information, um, which all is about sort of multiple people um, engaging with one another in very close proximity uh, and by virtue of that sort of increasing risk. And so what we are doing is following the guidance of our uh, health experts at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and then they have said make sure that all of the desks are six feet apart um, and that you are limiting sort of interaction and social engagement time with students. And so instruction will continue from the, from the um, teacher during that time period. I am excited to say that uh, we do have an outdoor learning policy about roughly a little over half of our schools applied for outdoor learning. So they submitted applications uh, which detailed a plan. So every principal uh, submitted an application to use outdoor space, whether it's a nearby park, whether it is um, you know, the, the closed streets, whether it is uh, adjoining um, playground. And so they submitted these applications detailing how they would use outdoor space and we received them, a central team reviewed them, and uh, about over 800 uh, of those applications have been granted. And so those schools will be having outdoor lear learning as a feature of blended learning. Um, what we have encouraged in terms of, you know, what types of activities are appropriate for outdoor learning, physical education, the arts, music, uh, those are some of the, the subjects that we've uh, encouraged principals to, to focus their planning on with respect to outdoor learning. Um, but but yes, I, I, and we've gotten a lot of requests around this um, to, to think through like, well, how, why not bring students outside during lunch? Uh, and, and it just wasn't, wasn't feasible and there was no safe way to, to be able to do that for every single student who was coming in um, to schools and blended learning. So we've encouraged um, for outdoor learning to be focused on the instructional activities that we think uh, are important for school communities and that are better suited for outdoors. Uh, we received a comment from Michael Bacall. 
that the high schools were not operating, they have not received the class assignments or teachers, uh, and uh, that they're, I, and then we had an anonymous person comment the same. And uh, we also had a quick question of, is there a situation where the teacher might be remote with the kids in the classroom? Uh, and so if we can get those quick answers, uh, same thing from uh, Debbie Mayer around the, the teacher training. So uh, if folks feel that they're not getting the information they need at this point, uh, it sounds like they should email questions at bencalis.com with their specific school and information. Uh, and I guess would, will you be able to work with the parents to make sure that they get the answers that they need? Uh, I certainly will do that. I will tell you that, you know, we've had regional enrichment centers and the whole sort of model of staffing regional enrichment centers was in the, in the spring was to have, they, they were not staffed and not supervised by necessarily a licensed teacher of that subject area. Uh, the students were engaging remotely with their home school, with their assigned teacher, um, and then the staff of the rec centers were just sort of supervising the kids. So they were supervising, but they weren't actually providing instruction. We are now returning to a more traditional educational environment. And the idea around this is to make sure that there is live instruction from a teacher to students. And so just want to be super clear that uh, at, at every point, obviously, students are going to be supervised. Uh, never will there be a classroom of students that does not have an adult president who is supervising the students, but also that this is not regional enrichment centers where it's a, um, where students are engaging entirely with remote with an offsite teacher. Um, the real feature of this is to make sure that there is a certified teacher in the classroom providing instruction. On um, the issue of remote education, sorry, sorry the, the rec centers, uh, the rec centers were a godsend for our essential workers who which allowed them to go into work five days a week now we're going to the hybrid so how are we accommodating daycare workers and essential workers who are making these sacrifices and, and how will we make sure that the essential workers actually do have five day a week coverage yes uh, we absolutely know that child care is an issue for our parents across the city caregivers across the city we have a the city has started a learning bridges program this is a program that's run and operated through the city, through DYCD, uh, in partnership with DOE. And the Learning Bridges program is providing childcare for students on the days where they are not in blended learning. So for um, students on their off days where they're not coming into the school building, we are encouraging family members, caregivers, parents to sign up if you need that childcare to the Learning Bridges program. And the survey is available uh, and folks can sign up and should sign up now. The promise from the mayor was to have 100,000 seats uh, available to students to be able to accommodate, I'm sorry, 50,000 seats, you know, like when you do the math, but 100,000 students accommodated um, through Learning Bridges. And so that, that is the plan. And I know folks are working fast and furious to make sure that those seats are up and running as quickly as possible. So please, for parents, if you need the childcare, sign up for the Learning Bridges program uh, and go to our website, schools.nyc.gov and the link to sign up should be there. Is how many seats are still available? Because I know this today we had an announcement that there were 30,000, uh, I guess, seats, not slots. So uh, I guess how many are actually available? I think your 30,000 is what they have at this point in time and they are working toward 100,000 seats. I mean, I guess how, many, how many are already spoken for? Ah, that I don't know. I don't have that number for you. Okay, uh, if, if you can share that, I guess we, we you've got me, uh, we've got uh, roughly 100 or so people, uh, which I'd like to deputize uh, in order to try to find these spaces. So I, I've written a lot of letters I mentioned at the opening in terms of using libraries, existing community centers, senior centers, uh, even empty storefronts. Uh, we've got Dwayne Reed, several hundred of them that have closed. What are your requirements and how can people who are on this call help us get these? It sounds like we need 20,000 more physical seats. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's right uh, to serve because just to like do the math because it, it's a little confusing to people. We're gonna serve 100,000 seats because 100,000 students because we'll be serving half of the students for, for each part of the week. And so it's 50,000 seats, but it's available 
you know, Monday, Tuesday, and maybe Wednesday, and then so one set of students and Thursday, Friday to another, which brings us to 100,000. Um, and if, if folks have space, please, there's a, if you go to the city's website, there is a, a special donation link that you can click uh, for any, anyone who has space who wants to volunteer their space for this purpose. Um, there is a, a link on the city's website to be able to do that. I can tell you about our DOE's vetting process, uh, and I'm not sure that we're actually vetting the Learning Bridges spaces, but I can tell you that we independently, through our Deputy Chancellor Karen Goldmark, vetted many, many hundreds of spaces across the city just for our own purposes and thinking through blended learning and what, what we needed to do for that. It's incredibly complicated. Um, there are, if, you know, if you look at the, the air ventilation um, surveys that are up on the website, it gives you an inkling into like what kinds of inspections that spaces need to um, pass for us to be able to use them and staff them. Um, and so it's not sort of an easy, an easy process. And then on top of that, uh, we have like for our buildings, we're doing deep cleanings every day, which means we'll be cleaning every space with an electrostatic cleaner. Um, and we'll be sanitizing, you know, like every portion of the building. When it comes to private buildings and the contracts that they have for maintenance and like their requirements, it doesn't always meet the standards that we've set for safe, health and safety. So that's been a barrier for, 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 for us anyway in some of these spaces. Uh, we have about five minutes left if we end at seven. Are we able to keep you a little bit longer? We have about five or six groups of questions left. Sure. Thank you. That is very, very kind. Uh, that is very, very kind. Uh, there's a specific question around PS 267. Uh, our school PS 267 has a hard time with safe arrival, dismissal under normal circumstances with social distancing. 63rd Street will need to be closed at those times or a child is going to be struck. How can we guarantee safety during arrival and dismissal? Uh, yes, this is the difficult job that, that our principals, which is why I started by thanking our principals. It's the, the difficult work that our principals have been mapping out for the last you know, several weeks uh, and, and longer. And so principals are thinking through what needs to be the arrival procedure for schools. I've spoken to some principals and not this principal, uh, but I can certainly, if you send me an email, make sure I loop in um, this principal and get you more specific answer. But I've spoken to some principals who have staggered arrival times. So they're thinking through bringing in students in waves so that you don't have sort of a, a, a congregation of, of lots of families at one time. Um, but every principal is approaching this a little bit differently because every school community is different. And obviously the geography around uh, school communities is different. So I would just say, if you send me an email, I can specifically follow up with your principal and, and find out how that principal, and, and I would encourage you, please, if you have questions about what's happening, reach out to your principal. That is your best contact for how is this going to work because the principals are designing the plans for their schools. So if you submitted that question, feel free to email questions at bencalos.com. We'll work with you to try to get the answers and work with the DOE for that. On the last question, we got a question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, learning Bridges, does it, is, it, is the Learning Bridges program available to remote only students? Uh, I believe that Learning Bridges, the priority group for Learning Bridges in terms of how they're assessing, um, you know, how they're, how they're assigning students is they're looking first at essential workers who are in blended learning. Uh, they're looking at DOE staff, obviously our DOE teachers who uh, have children. Um, but that those are the, the first priority groups that they're going to make sure that they have seats for first. So it's going to be students who are in blended learning, parents who need childcare, that are essential workers. Uh, and I think they'll, they'll continue to sort of assign from there. Uh, we have the, the, the first question received on the, uh, on the Q&A is from uh, Meredith. And then we had also received it submitted online. And full disclosure, I'm a proud graduate of the Bronx High School of Science. Is there any plan on safe, safely administering the SHSAT exam in person? Please share any updates and plan for high school admissions, especially due to the lack of metrics for last year's seventh grader. Hello, can the DOE give any sense of when they will notify parents on what exactly is happening for high school admissions for rising eighth graders, given the lack of metrics from seventh grade? Even information on when we can expect to know how admissions will be handled would be appreciated. Uh, also, any updates on the SHSAT? Ah, oh, these, you know, of course, uh, uh, these questions, these are, these are questions a lot of families want to know. I will say on a related matter, uh, Deputy Chancellor Wallach and I did a sort of a listening session with families around middle school screens in the spring. Um, I know he is thinking about this. He's thinking about, you know, how do you administer tests in this environment? 
Um, how do you utilize a grading policy, which we had a, a revised sort of different grading policy this year. Um, how does that factor into the admissions matrix? Um, how do we think about um, all of the criteria that normally are, are used to determine whether or not students are going to be admitted to both screened and specialized um, high schools. And he's thinking through that and has not yet issued a policy, but I, I do believe once we get through um, school reopening, which is where all of us are sort of, you know, focusing our, our attention, once we get past that, I, I believe we will then turn to, to the admissions policies. Uh, we have about two question groups left on uh, pre-submitted, and then we have a bunch of q and I'm going to kind of cut folks off on the Q&A questions at this point, but we, we do have a group relating to the teachers and the staff. Uh, one is, uh, uh, Councilman, I want to know about staff, teacher, health and safety. I have friends and family members who are teachers. What are their options if they get COVID? What is the plan for staff member teachers? Uh, and another anonymous attendee becoming infected with COVID, will they be required to quarantine for 14 days and their students be transferred to a second teacher, remote teacher? You mentioned earlier where a new teacher step in that classroom take over during the teacher's absence. Will that staff member be paid for their medical absence? Uh, we've been, and then from Sharon Miri Fox, we've been told by school officials that our students may be taught by substitute teachers. How will they learn the curriculum to be able to teach? Students deserve so much. Uh, uh, I think that is that group of questions. Thank you, Council Member Halos. Um, so I can tell you, I guess I'll just step back and tell you what the health and safety protocol is. So if, if, if anyone in a school building, and this is students or staff to a particular class, if any one of those students or staff members that is assigned to a class uh, test positive for COVID, that an entire class of students and that staff member will be quarantined for 14 days. So that entire class goes offline for 14 days in quarantines. If two or more um, cases or, or folks within a school community test positive within a seven day period, two or more in different classes, um, the entire school will go offline and test and trace will come in and do an investigation and they will tell us when it is safe and under what conditions it is safe to reopen. Um, so this is, we sort of have a, a conservative approach to how we're going to respond um, to COVID cases and any sort of positive COVID cases because we obviously want to preserve the health and safety of our students and staff. And so if there is a staff member or if there's a student in a class who tests positive, that entire entire class is going offline and going to be quarantined. Uh, and you had a question about substitute teachers and you know how do we make sure in this environment substitute teachers or, or, or anyone who is um, sort of not a part of the day-to-day -day school community um, how, do, how do we ensure that there's, you know, quality instruction happening? These are challenging times. And, and I think it, there's no secret that, that the, we have some real staffing challenges. Um, I do believe that having certified teachers, if they're substitute teachers who are coming in, um, if they are ATR teachers who are assigned and teaching uh, students, if they are centrally deployed teachers who have credentials and are coming in to teach students, um, that that is, the, the vision is to, to make sure we have quali qualified um, teachers coming in to directly provide instruction. And I think we can all agree that having in-person instruction is the ideal uh, for all students, having an environment where students can come in and the teacher can explain things in person and sort of respond to the body mechanics uh, and the environment of the classroom and respond specifically to students and have that in-person engagement, that's the ideal. And that's what we're trying to provide um, for, for our families and for our students. And so, um, I, you know, it's not perfect. Having substitute teachers is probably, you know, having a substitute is, is not quite the same necessarily as having a teacher who's been at the same school for 10 years. And, you know, it's not the same, but we're doing the best under these circumstances. And we do believe that we can provide a very quality experience, educational experience for our students. And that's, that's what's at the heart of what we're trying to do. I now kind of feel bad for how I treated every substitute teacher I ever had at Rock Science. Uh, in a serious and likely dour note, what will the impact of state level budget cuts in education if New York State does not get more federal dollars or new tax revenues aren't raised on the state level as is currently being proposed? Um, you know, it's that's a it's an obvious sort of answer that, that it would be crippling. Uh, what we are trying to do in this time period is incredibly 
ambitious and it's also um, you know, we believe in public education. I think everybody from the chancellor to everyone is in his cabinet to all the way down to like, you know, every principal, every, every teacher, everyone who works in our system. And we are 150,000 employees strong. We believe in what we do. We believe in kids um, as our future. We believe in education as the promise. Um, and so, you know, to think of what it could mean if we don't have the funding we need for PPE, for, you know, all of the increased, um, cleanings that are required for our school buildings, for our teachers, for it, it, it will have a drastic impact. And, and I don't even want to think about um, what that could mean. We have suffered a, uh, a, a billion, a, over a billion dollars of cuts over the last two years already. Uh, and so we are lean, meaning we have cut programs. We have, we have, you know, we're not doing things that we would like to be doing. We are redeploying our central staff, which has a tremendous impact on how we support schools because it's not like there's people and central staff that are doing nothing. Those folks are doing professional development for teachers. They're supporting schools in a variety of ways. And so we are really lean and we are struggling with, with where we are financially. And so we are hoping for federal support. Uh, we found out recently that FEMA is not gonna be paying for PPE, which was what, what was a part of the, the, the budget plan. They were supposed to pay for PPE for schools across the country and they're not now. Um, and so, you know, we are at this this sort of juncture where hopefully our elected officials um, decide that it's important to continue to invest in our kids and our young people. And, and that's what we are, that's what I'm hoping, that's what we're all hoping. And if not, then, then that's gonna mean some really difficult decisions down the road. Uh, and it will mean a sacrifices to our public education system. That's, that's tough stuff. And uh, this is the first year I've been a council member where the, usually the state does their budget in April, we do our budget in June, and then that's it for the year. Uh, the, gov the, the state has re re uh, reserved their right to go back and cut the city's budget twice or three times, I believe, this year. So it's going to be tough. I'm just looking at the walkthrough uh, and survey for PS290, and I'm noticing, uh, because there were questions about gym space, that the studio and the auditorium are marked as inaccessible. Uh, so I'm just asking if your team can go through and make sure that any of the spaces that weren't surveyed get surveyed before the 21st. And yeah. I'll ask the parents that if you check your survey uh, through the DOE site, if you can, uh, if there's anything that is missing, let us know. Uh, we have about five questions left. Uh, we were talking about some of the cuts. I, and and um, one of the things I've said before, and I'll say it again, one of my favorite parts of Bronx Science was the after school activities. I lived for it, it was better than camp. Uh, are there any, and I introduced legislation on universal after school, are there any plans to implement after school extended day programming? Will teaching artists from DOE's uh, creative arts programming liaisons be allowed in schools for after school extended day and in school arts programming? Not have teaching artists in school residencies and extended day program been considered for virtual remote learning? Great question. I think we all believe in extracurricular activities and uh, enrichment activities for our students. Uh, I can tell you that the we fought uh, really hard to make sure that we have some of our after school activities uh, and funding um, for our DYCD programs that come in for, and provide aftercare. And so uh, that is looking good. We are very excited that we believe that we will be able to have DYCD programs come in and provide that um, after school support for our, our, our students and for our families. Um, Outside of that, I think it's really challenging. We are in a pandemic and part of this is about making sure that there's enough time for our custodial staff to come in and do deep cleanings of our school building. We want to be able to sort of regulate social distancing um, and all of the, you know, making sure that all of the safety protocols that we have worked with the Department of Health to create are implemented, which becomes more challenging when there are programs that aren't city run and sort of city, city sponsored. And so uh, I can tell you that, that there will be some after school programs. Uh, I can't, I can also tell you that, you know, there may not be every single after school program that uh, folks want to run or used to run or because uh, we have a lot of privately sponsored programs as well that, that may or may not be able to run because of our current uh, environment. But we are, we are supportive and more, more to come on exactly what it's going to look like. Our social worker, this is from Sharon Mary Fox, are social workers required per schools or per building? What if an IEP requires counseling and there is no social worker on staff? Uh, we are required under, under the IDEA to comply with uh, the services that are mandated in the IEP. 
So if a student has within that student's IEP that they're, you know, required to uh, or, or need to be serviced through counseling of some sort, then that has to happen. Uh, it's a legal requirement. So I, you know, like I would want to know more uh, about the sort of if, it, if this is raising an issue and would love to troubleshoot if, if you're seeing something uh, at your school or at a school that you know of where this is potentially an issue. Um, I will say we have had record investments in social workers and guidance counselors in our schools in the last few years. Uh, and I can get you more specific in numbers. I know we've got thousands of social workers and guidance counselors and we should have at least one in every school. So um, I would, you know, like, I know there are questions maybe about like, well, what happens if uh, within a school, you know, a social worker or a guidance counselor maybe has re requested um, an accommodation uh, I, I would need to, to look into that more specifically to get back to you on, on what exactly is happening at this particular school. Okay, so if, the, if, if Sharon, if you don't mind emailing me, we'll work with you and DOE to get a, a suitable answer, but we do have a guarantee that if the IEP stipulates uh, the counseling that you will get it because that is the law. So that is a good answer. Uh, as a, a child who run, wrote a public school bus and is not proud of my behavior on this public school bus either. Um, Deputy Chancellor, just, just to ask, because you're laughing, did you, did you take by any chance a public school bus and were you well behaved on that bus? <laughs> no, but my children do and, and I can imagine, especially my little one. Um, <laughs> so so how, how is safety enforced in the school bus, uh, particularly for buses that don't have working windows? So the school buses will have, will be, the windows will be open. Uh, there should be windows on every school bus and the schools will have, the school buses will be observing social distancing. Uh, we will only be using 25 or, or we have as our max 25% uh, capacity in terms of what, how we are um, assigning students to buses. And so we won't be assigning 100% of the seating capacity of that bus will only be going up to 25%. And that's to make sure that we have social distancing on the buses. There'll be um, demarcations, I guess, of like where students sit. So there'll be like an X on a seat. Uh, so the students are not sitting next to one another unless there are siblings. Uh, and there's a pretty well thought out just policy. PPE will be pro provided to every student uh, who comes to, to the to school bus. So as soon as they come on, if they don't already have their PPE, there will be PPE uh, on the buses provided to the students. Um, and there will be deep cleanings of the buses every day. So daily cleanings of the, of the um, school buses that sort of mirror what's happening in the schools. I saved the uh, most optimistic, call me Pollyannish, but uh, a, the best question, I guess, uh, a, a hopeful question uh, in a world of, of just trying to get through 2020. Uh, this is from an anonymous attendee and I thank you, whoever you are who put this in. Uh, if a vaccine or a steady amount of low positive cases with remaining, uh, low positive uh, remains with reopening, would all plans be revisited to return, return to school or add more days live? So uh, in terms of pl planning for the, uh, <laughs> planning for the best, uh, that's the last question. I mean, that, and you're right, that, that's the, the right question, right? That's the right way to look at this. Look, this isn't gonna be forever. Uh, it can't be forever. I think sometimes it's been so long that, that for most of us, we start to adapt and we're like, maybe it's gonna be like, it's not. Eventually we're gonna get out of this one way or the other, hopefully with a vaccine. Um, and, and when that day comes, we will all be happily there together uh, and we'll be out in the restaurants and we'll be probably being more social than we ever have before because we're at this point a little socially deprived, at least speaking for myself. So, so we're looking forward to that, that place uh, and being able to reopen our schools and sort of go back to, go back to learning. Although I do think that um, we have done some really phenomenal things with, with technology over the course of the last uh, six months. And so you know, improving, you know, going back and to, to what we had before, but also taking the lessons that we've learned across the last six months and making sure we, we carry those forward. Deputy Chancellor Adrian Austin, I wanted to thank you. You've been smiling the whole time. You, you've cheered me up. I want to thank Julian Sepulveda from your staff and the entire DOE team. I want to thank the over 100 folks who participated tonight, those on uh, the Zoom. We received more than uh, 40 or so questions that we answered through the Q&A feature on Zoom. We received probably another 40, and I think you answered almost every single 
Uh, one of them, if we didn't get to your question, please send uh, your question to questions at benkalos.com. We will do our best to get you an answer. If you weren't happy with any of the questions, uh, we will do our best to get you a better answer. And if you are able to help us, whether it's trying to find uh, remote learning centers, uh, you've been deputized, we, we want to work with you. And uh, whatever we can do, we're in partnership uh, to make sure that our schools are as safe as possible. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor. Thank you to everyone. I also want to thank all of my staff for being here today and helping make this a successful event. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. See you in school. Thank oh. you, Council Member.